So in 1 Timothy chapter 1, we see here Paul is writing a letter to Timothy. Timothy is a preacher. He's someone that Paul has, has worked with and has trained for the ministry. Timothy is someone who's, who is a, he's trained to become a pastor. And that's why we see in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and in other places, we see you know, a lot of the um, qualifications for a pastor and um, the teaching and instruction that he's giving him regarding the church and, and all of these different things in this passage. And we started off in chapter number 1. It's written unto Timothy, as I said, and he tells them here in verse number 3, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Um, he's saying you need to take charge. You need to say, you know, make sure that people are teaching the right doctrine. Timothy is in charge and overseeing what's being taught in, um, in Ephesus or in, in, um, yeah, in Ephesus where he's writing to Timothy that, hey, people are careful about the doctrines that they're teaching. Paul is the one who, who really taught Timothy a lot of what he knows. And he's telling Timothy now, and he's giving just more further instruction on how to preach and how to be a preacher and what things to look out for. And he says, hey, make sure that people are, aren't teaching false doctrine. He says that, that they teach no other doctrine, verse 4, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies. He's saying, you know, I know that this is a sticking point with some people that they're going to get caught up in all these genealogies that don't get caught up in that. That's foolishness. That's nonsense. Because the Jews at that time were so concerned with their genealogy. And he's saying here, avoid that stuff. Don't give heed to Jewish fables. Don't listen to their stories and these things that are made up. You know, stick with the Word of God. And he says, which minister questions, these endless genealogies minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. Verse 5, now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned, from which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling. So he's saying, you know, the end of the commandment, the, you know, the, 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 the laws and the commandments is charity out of a pure heart. Charity is love for other people, helping other people, teaching other people, and, and being there to minister unto other people. That's the end. You know, you learn all these different things. You try to improve yourself so that you can have charity to help other people. And he says, charity out of a good heart, of a good conscience, of faith unfeigned. It's not faked, right? When you feign something, you're kind of faking it. He says, your faith it shouldn't be in pretense. It shouldn't be faked and just and shallow, right? You have a solid faith. That's the end. And he says, some people have swerved, have turned aside from that goal, from the, from the charity, from the faith unfeigned, unto vain jangling. He's talking about people who just talk about things that don't even matter. Vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law. And that's the, the, the title of my sermon this morning, desiring to be teachers. Desiring to be teachers of law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. There are people, the Bible, is, where the Apostle Paul is, is telling Timothy, you know, this is the end result. You know, you, you're working towards charity and faith unfeigned. But there's people that will turn aside from that. They'll turn aside from, from the sound doctrine unto vain jangling and people who are just speaking things that don't really matter and they get caught up in these endless genealogies and they get caught up in you know the Nephilim and they get caught up in all these other things that really don't matter at all. And they spend so much time dealing with all of these things that, that they shouldn't even be messing around. Jewish fables. And you know what? Honestly, this Nephilim thing with the giants, it's a Jewish fable. The reason why so many people put stock in that at all is because they read like Josephus and these other books you know, the book of Enoch, which are basically books of Jewish fables because they're not scripture. It is not the word of God. They're just Jewish writings or Jewish fables. And people put so much stock into that. And we have so many people today that are desiring to be teachers. And now I'll be the first to admit, you know, technology is not inherently a bad thing. It's nothing wrong with technology in and of itself. But because of the technology these days, it has given people a very large soapbox to become teachers and try to, try to get followers when normally they wouldn't even have such an avenue. 
for themselves. But what I'm talking about today are the YouTube teachers. There are people today that do not go to church anywhere. There are people today that, that are just out of church, but yet they think they are so smart. They think they know so much about the Bible that they're going to be a teacher. They're going to tell you what it's like. And this, there are so many people like this out there. They have their YouTube channels, and they do their Bible studies, and they think they're serving God, and they think they're doing all this stuff, and they spend all this time researching the Nephilim, researching the giants, researching you know, the serpent seed, and all these other things. That's just nonsense. They're desiring to be a teacher. Now look, some of these people... Some of these people are just wicked false prophets. They're not even saved, and they're just trying to, to be a teacher of the law, and they don't even know what they're talking about whatsoever. Other of them, though, I believe they have a good heart or a good intent, and they may even be saved, but they're going about things all wrong. They have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Now, who was Timothy? Timothy was someone who was brought up and taught and trained. He had the Apostle Paul teaching him from a young age, the Apostle Paul who got him saved, he calls him son Timothy, and is still continuing to teach him and give him good doctrine from the Word of God. He's literally giving him the Word of God and teaching him how to be a teacher and how to be a pastor. Yet people today, they think they could just jump on the internet, they hear something they like, or they hear something they don't like, and they just want to go off and refute things and say, oh, yeah. And you're saying, oh, but, you know, what makes you so special? Look, it's not about me. It's not saying that I am so special. It's a pattern of becoming a teacher that people are just completely ignoring and doing away with. You say, well, I have the Holy Spirit residing inside me too, so why can't I teach me? Look, you can teach people. But you have to teach people things that you learn. Too many people these days are becoming teachers of things that they don't know what they're talking about. Amen. Way too many people. I'm going to get into some specifics in a little bit later. But look, if you would, at 2 Timothy chapter 4. Where we were just reading, I didn't read this last verse. We, did, we read the whole chapter. But um, you know, after it says, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm, but we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Too many, too many YouTube preachers out there are taking the law and not using it lawfully. They're not interpreting it lawfully. They're just, they're just going out and spouting off their opinions without having any real backing for it. 2 Timothy chapter number 4. Look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, I charge thee therefore. Look, these are more charges from the Apostle Paul to Timothy. This is what we're reading. Paul is giving more further instruction unto his protege, unto his, unto his um, you know, preacher, son in the faith, that he is trained to become a pastor or a teacher. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Timothy, this preacher, is being exhorted to teach doctrine. You need to come to church to hear the doctrine that's being taught out of the Bible by a man of God who has been taught doctrine by other men of God through God's Word and using God's Word as the support, as the evidence to learn this doctrine. Verse 3. For the time will come, and I believe we're in this time right now, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. The reason why these people are even getting views on YouTube is because there's so many people out there that, are, that have itching ears. And they're looking for people to tell them whatever it is that they want them, whatever they want to hear. Now, not everyone that has a YouTube channel is doing this to tickle people's ears, but there are plenty of people out there that are just, they're interested in, they're not interested in the regular doctrines of the Bible. They're bored with that. They're bored with preaching against fornication. They're bored with preaching against alcohol. They're bored with preaching about coming to church. And they're bored with preaching the gospel. They're bored with all these things. So they want all of these, you know, Oh, UFO. Let's talk about, yeah, let's do a study on UFOs, man. Hey, let's do a study on the giants. Let's do a study on all this stuff that just stupid. 
It's vain jangling. It's, it's, it's nothing. It's vanity. But that's what they want to hear. And they're heaping these teachers to themselves. Verse 4, And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Now look, I hear about these things, you know, these Planet X and like all this other stuff that's happening and the end of the world and people prophesying all these different things. Some of it can be a little bit mildly interesting for a little while. Oh yeah, that's kind of cool, but you know what? I'm not going to invest that much time into it. Because it's all speculation anyways. Who knows what data you're looking at and where you're getting this information from anyways. And, and it's not in the Bible. We know what the Bible says about the end times. We don't need to match everything up with these planets and, and stars and UFOs and, you know, and all this other stuff. Look, let's stick with Scripture. Let's stick with sound doctrine. Amen. Let's not worry about getting off on these little rabbit trails because you think they're just so exciting and interesting and, oh, people need to know. No, people don't need to know that. What people need to know, one, is how to get saved. And what people need to know, number two, is to get their butts in church. And what people need to know is to train and get trained to go out and preach the gospel to other people. That's what people need to know. People need to know how to clean up their lives. People need to know how to get sin out of their life. That's what people need to know. They don't need to know about these stupid giants. Now, I know I'm picking on the giants a lot, but it's kind of like, who cares? I just hear that so much sometimes. It's, it's ridiculous to me. Why does anyone care so much about that one topic? I mean, some people, that's like a make it or break it topic for them. Like, oh, well, you don't believe that? Well, I'm not coming to your church. Or something, you know, it's ridiculous. Now, not everyone's like that. I'm not trying to paint everyone with some big, broad brush. I get it. All I'm saying is that these things are vain. It does not matter. The Bible says in verse 5 of 1, 2 Timothy 4, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. I like the phrase. He's telling Timothy, because Timothy's a pastor, do the work of an evangelist. That is your job. You need to go out and preach the gospel also. And he says, make full proof of thy ministry. When you go to a church, if you're going to sit down and listen and be taught doctrine, you need to make sure that the church that you're sitting in, the teaching that you're receiving from, is, is, is truly from a man of God, someone who's saved and someone who's teaching you right doctrine. The way that you know if that's true is if they are making full proof of their ministry. You see the fruits of of what is happening with the pastor, with the church as a whole, with the people that come to the church. Honestly, this is the one thing, the one reason, the, not the one, the biggest reason, the biggest impact that, had, that, was, that was left on me when I first attended Faithful Word Baptist Church, the, the biggest impact was the fruit of the church. Now, we have way too many people these days, they get a lopsided view. For one of Pastor Anderson, you know, I don't need to defend him. He has done, he's done a good job and his work speaks for itself. People watch online and they get this, this twisted view and they'll see these clips and say, oh, he's just all hateful and mean and everything else. Look, you don't know the man. Anybody, everybody who goes to that church and has, has been in the service and has seen in action the workings of that church, not even just Pastor Anderson, but the whole church, knows that that is not a hateful church at all. Amen. Not in the slightest bit. And I knew this all the way back from the first time I stepped inside that church building, and I started to get to know him, and I started to get to know the people in the church, and I saw the works that were being done, that it wasn't just a Pharisee standing up and saying, oh, you all need to be holy while he goes back and and, you know, does everything against what he's saying. I saw a man of integrity who's actually doing the things that he says and leading people and going out and doing them and reaching other people and helping out anybody that's in need and going out and winning the lost souls. Hey, that made a big impact on me. Why? Because it's the fruit of the ministry. He's preaching hard, preaching God's word and going out and doing the work. The work that really matters. Not getting hung up on stupid, vain arguments but going out and doing the things that actually matter. Helping people when they're in need. Yes, he's done it. He never was going to talk about it because he's a man of integrity. But I know firsthand. 
That's one of the problems with the internet is you don't get a proper view of anything. Now, that's people not getting a proper view of that church or this church or any church because if you're sitting at home and watching a video, you don't know everything about the church. You know one thing. You know what video you've seen and some preaching that you've seen, but you don't know what the whole church is about. You don't know how loving and caring the people in the pews are and how much they look out for each other and help each other when they're down and edify each other like a true church should be. As opposed to the ones where there's churches where there's all these cliques and groups and people backbiting and talking trash about each other and looking down their noses at people. That is not what that church is like and that's not what this church is like. But you'll never know that until you come and sit down and get in the church. Amen. You'll never know that. People want to think that they're in church sitting on their couch and watching YouTube. And how are you going to understand the full proof of someone else's ministry? If you're not going and being a part of that church, who are you getting your learning from? When you come to church, you can see, you can get to know them. You can see the things that they do because you're here for real and it's physical. You can see everything that's going on. You can see the operation. But when it's just some video on YouTube, you have no idea what, you have no idea how they're living their life or how anything goes outside of what's just on that camera screen for that short period of time. You don't get to see the fruits of what they're doing. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 5. Does the teacher that you follow online, on YouTube, do they go out soul winning? How do you even know that? Is it just because they say that they do? You don't, you don't know. You won't get to see the full proof of the ministry. And if the, if the pastor is, is doing the work of an evangelist like he's supposed to do, like the Apostle Paul said, and one of the purposes for that is you got to make full proof of your ministry. You're legitimate. This is what you're all about. It's that charity and unfeigned faith. You can fake your faith in front of a camera. But you can't fake it in real life when you're actually out doing things and helping people and preaching the gospel and people see that. Why do people see that? Because you're trying to get them to come out and go with you if you're a good pastor or if you're a good teacher. Like all these people want to be these teachers. Hebrews chapter 5, look at verse number 10. Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat." This is real interesting because it fits in perfectly with that story we were just talking about. We were out soul winning this afternoon. And Sebastian, Brother Sebastian was talking to a man who was not wanting to listen to a word he said because he was saved so much longer than Brother Sebastian was. And he just, just couldn't, even, couldn't even listen. His, his pride, was so, he was so lifted up that he could not hear the truth of what Brother Sebastian was, was trying to teach him and show him from the gospel about salvation because he just had this in his mind, well, I've been saved. I've been saved for so much, probably longer than you've even been alive. I've been saved for so many years. The guy wasn't even saved, yet he had this haughty attitude. This verse applies perfectly for a man like that. It says, for the time, so for as long as he's been going to church and he thinks he's been saved, he ought to be a teacher. But he can't be a teacher, even if he wants to be. This is, this is a perfect example of someone who's probably got a YouTube channel and teaching all kinds of people his false doctrine and heresy because he thinks that he's been saved for so long that he can just be the teacher now. And I like what Brother Sebastian said because he said something to the effect of, you know, hey, I'm not here to be taught by you. I'm here to teach and, and show you how to be saved because you're not saved. And amen for, for, for saying that. And you know what? When you go out soul winning, you're not there to be taught by other people. So don't let them just get you caught up and waste your time listening to all the, the garbage that comes out of your mouth. It doesn't mean you can't have a conversation with people, but some people, and you know what I'm talking about if you go out soul winning enough, 
Some people you can have a conversation with and you have a respectful conversation and they say something different than you say and they have different beliefs, yet you can still have a conversation and talk to people and, and even have differing beliefs. But some people, man, they just want to tell you and teach you and cut you off when you try to say something and they're there to teach you and that's what this guy was like. And you can't, you can't just sit around for that and let them walk all over you. Say, no, you're not saved. You need to be taught. I don't care if I've only been saved for a couple years, but you're not even saved. You need to listen to this. But people who are that proud, they're not going to learn anyways. And he did the right thing. He's just like, he left because the guy's not listening, not receiving it. And the heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject. Amen. But there are so many people out there for the time they spend in church, for the time... For the, for the amount of time they've been saved, for all these years that go by, they ought to be teachers. And what's this telling you that it takes time to be a teacher? Man, I'm getting sick and tired of seeing so many people, they get saved, and then like a couple months later, they just want to teach the world on everything. Maybe they learn a lot real quick from, from a good pastor or someone like that, or, or they're learning what they think is to be truth. And I understand the zeal, and I like the zeal, but we have to have zeal according to knowledge. And don't just, just go off half-cocked thinking that you're just going to teach the world about stuff that you just learned yesterday. Now, there is one instance where I think that anyone could be a teacher, and that's with salvation. If you're saved, you know how to be saved, teach other people how to be saved. Show them how to be saved with what you know from the Bible, from the Scripture. Show them the verses that you know that explain salvation and explain it to them to the best of your ability because you know that to be true. But it doesn't mean that you're qualified just to teach on every subject in the Bible. I'll be the first one to admit, look, when I first got saved, do you think that I had the understanding and capabilities of just teaching on some of the more complicated subjects in the Bible? Do you think I was just an expert on end times prophecy? Because, hey man, I just got saved. Now I'm going to start teaching everyone everything about the Bible. No. It takes time. The Bible says precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. That's how we learn. We pick up things and it takes time to learn these things. If you want to be a teacher first, you have to know them. But knowing them isn't enough. You need to know it well enough to teach other people. Don't just start parroting things that you hear from someone else. It's one thing to learn something. It's another thing to be able to teach it. Here's a great example. You know, who knows in this room, who knows how a, a car works, generally speaking? You know, you put gas in it. You know, there's a spark. You know, there's a combustion. You know, that pistons move. You know, that turns to the axles and the wheels go and the car moves. Right? Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Not very difficult. Having that knowledge is one thing, but now who is able to teach someone else all of the details on how that actually works, the whole process from start to finish? That's a whole other thing. Being able to teach on that is different than just a base, having a basic, simple concept. A teacher needs to be well-learned. That's why the Bible says one of the qualifications for a pastor is not a novice. A novice is someone who is a beginner. Everybody starts off as a beginner. Everybody does. But that is, does the person who's doing the teaching... The pastor ought not to be a beginner. So if you just got saved last week, don't think that you're in a position now to be this great teacher and I'm going to start my YouTube channel. I'm going to teach everyone all this stuff about the Bible. Look, learn first. You want to tell people about the gospel of Christ? Have at it. Go for it. Publish it all. You know, you're saved. Yeah, preach the gospel to every creature. Amen and amen. You start learning some things more in depth and, and you start learning more enough about it to teach. Hey, teach what you know, but leave it at that. Don't start getting too big for your britches thinking that you could just teach on everything and anything just because you feel like you're a teacher of the Bible, because you want to serve God. And hey, again, I like the zeal and, and, the, and the attitude of wanting to serve God, but do it the right way. Do it lawfully. Do it the way that God has ordained and intended. 
He's intended for the church to be established. We see this in Ephesians chapter 4. Turn, if you would, to, Hebrews cha or to Ephesians chapter 4. We read this this morning. I think we even read it last week, but it's a great passage. We'll read it again tonight. Ephesians chapter 4. Because the job of a teacher is an important job in the church. And God has ordained a job of a teacher. But don't think that you have the authority just to usurp that position and that job without doing it the way that God has provided He's provided it through the local church. He hasn't provided it through YouTube. He's, he's provided it here. Yeah, you, we don't have a, you know, attend your, your nearest local YouTube channel. <laughs> M video ministry. And that's, not, you know, this drive, people have, people have like, this is my ministry. This is what I, I have a video ministry. And like, that's all they do. They say, well, this is how I serve God. Well, that ought not to be all that you do. You ought to publish videos, whatever, but there are a lot of people out there that make it. They, they get support. People literally donate to them. They don't go to church and they watch these videos online and they think that that's what they need. I'm getting my teaching from this teacher. And this guy lives off of what we give him, what we support him with, and he just comes out with more videos and more Bible studies. Isn't that great? Not doing the job of a pastor. Not an ordained pastor, for one. No one is ordained. I, mean, I preach an entire sermon about ordained pastors and God's design for that and, and the laying on of hands of the presbytery and being sent out by the local congregation of someone who's qualified to do it, who has met those qualifications, and who has been, in the eyes of the church, someone who is a faithful man that, is, that has had these things committed unto him to teach others. They don't have that, yet they want to be a teacher. And a lot of times it's because they think, well, all these other churches are wrong, so no one's going to send them out to be a pastor anyways. So they say, I know what I'll do. I'll just go on YouTube. Watch out for that guy. There's a reason why no one's going to send him out to be a pastor. It's because he's wrong, because he's a heretic. Ephesians chapter 4, look at verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. God giving these roles, these positions of apostles, and evangelists, and pastors, and teachers. Yes, it is an important job, and God has given that. And why did he give that in verse 12? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. Not the work of the video ministry. For the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. God wants us to be unified in faith in the local church, in this setting, in this body of Christ that we have, and we're members individually in the church. Verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. These deceivers are out there using cunning cat craftiness and they're the majority of your YouTube preachers that are out there. These people who don't, and I'm not talking about just pastors of a church who record their sermons and upload it. I'm talking about people who like, that is what they do. Like they just make videos for YouTube and try to teach other people. There are a lot that are out there trying to find these children that are tossed to and fro and just pick up, oh, wow, that sounds good. And, and they get swept away with this stuff because they don't know the Bible. Because they can't spot these heretics a mile away because they don't even know. They're ignorant of Scripture and they don't want to do the work for themselves. They let other people spoon feed them and they're saying, oh, wow, yeah, that sounds great. Verse 15, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Now, um, I don't even think, did I even read Hebrews 5? Oh yeah, I started to read it. 
I didn't get to the, to the rest. It says, for the, for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. For he is a babe, but strong meat belongeth to him that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. A lot of these video ministers, they, they need milk. They're trying to teach the meat. They're trying to serve up the meat. And they themselves are a baby. They need the milk. They need to get saved. Or they, they just need to understand the first principles of God. The basics. Flip over if you would to 1 Timothy chapter 3. We'll, we'll look at some of these qualifications for a bishop. 1 Timothy 3, verse number 1 says, This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Look, as I said before, hey, you want to be a teacher? Great. That's a good work to desire. That's something that's a good thing, a position to have. A, a bishop, a pastor of a church, an elder, even a deacon. Hey, that's a good work. Good for you for wanting to have that job. That's a good thing. We want to promote that. But don't just step into that job and think you could fill it if you don't have the qualifications met. Let's look at the qualifications. Now, this is for a bishop. It's not just a teacher, but a bishop is a teacher. I don't think that, that you have to be a bishop in order to teach people. I don't think that. Other people can teach. But let's look at the, the office of a bishop. Let's look at these requirements. Verse number two. A bishop then must be blameless. So is this someone who's just, just running out and getting into sin left and right and that, and that is obviously living a lifestyle that's just full of sin? No. He needs to be blameless, above reproach, basically. The husband of one wife. You have to be married. And I believe that's talking about not being divorced or not having multiple wives. Both of them, I think, apply. But you have to be the husband of one wife. Vigilant, always on the lookout. Sober. Sober means serious. You have to take things seriously because you're doing a serious work for God of good behavior. You know how to, to behave yourself. Given to hospitality, you know, you have to have the, the, the hospitality of, of being able to, to um, you know, help people out, make people feel comfortable and at home and welcome and, and be able to serve others, being hospitable to them and apt to teach. Have the ability, the aptitude even to teach people. Some people want to be teachers, but they don't really have the ability to do it. They have a hard time getting their point across and explaining what does this really mean and breaking things down in a way that people can easily understand. You have to have that ability to do that if you want to be a teacher. Verse 3, not given to wine. You can't, be, you can't be a drunk. You can't be drinking alcohol. It's going to pervert your judgment. No striker. Not someone who easily just gets in a fight or a brawl. Someone who get, who's who fights with people, not greedy of filthy lucre, is someone who's not covetous and, and worried about making money. If you're worried about making money and you go into the job of being a bishop and you want that job, that's going to pervert your, your ability to tell the truth also because you'll be more concerned about getting money from people in the pews than you are going to be about teaching the truth. But patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. So obviously he has, has to have a wife and he has to have children in order to be a bishop because how are you going to judge how he rules his house if he doesn't have a household to rule? Wife and children. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? And this is you know, a big point for this. You know, we're going to look at a man, we're going to see a man in the church and see if he's qualified to, to run and, and have this position of the pastor who oversees the flock, we'll see how well he oversees his family before we put him in a position to oversee even more people, their welfare, their benefit. How are they doing? How are things going with them? Well, you need to be able to rule and what? Rule your household. You have to have, if you don't have the respect of your own family, of your own children, why in the world is anyone else going to respect you or want to listen to what you have to say? If you can't even have the respect of your own family, of your own wife and of your own children. Hey, not everyone has the respect of their family. 
person could still serve God, but they're not, they ought not to be the pastor because there's a qualification that says that they need to rule their own house well. Their children need to be in subjection to them. Verse 6, not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. And a lot of these YouTube preachers that I've seen, they think they're so smart, they think they're there to teach other people, and they have a proud attitude and unable to be corrected. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach in the snare of the devil. In order to be a good teacher, you need to know what you're talking about. I've already brought this up, but I can't stress enough. You have to know it. You, if you can't take questions, when someone, you're teaching on a subject, and someone says, well, what about this verse? Well, what about that verse? If you, can't, if you just can't answer that, and it's very pertinent and completely obviously pertinent to what you're teaching on, then you ought not to be teaching on it. If you can't feel these types of, of responses and questions, you ought not to be teaching on it. I saw a video recently by a person that seems like they really want to be a teacher. And they claim that in their videos, that they're, you know, this is, I'm here, to you. I want to teach you, I want to show you the truth, and I'm just interested in the truth. And you know what, that's great. They post their videos online, and I, th I honestly think their heart's in the right place. But they're completely lacking in knowledge. And I'm thinking about one person in particular. I'm not going to name him because I, I think he's a good guy. And if he watches this sermon, you know, I'm, I, if, if he knows who I'm talking about him, then, then you know, I, I, I like him. I like you and, and you're welcome at our church. But if you want to be a teacher, you need to get the knowledge first. The video that I'm, that I'm thinking about that I saw was regarding reprobates. And the person claimed to have done a study on it. So he's saying, I did this study on this and I'm going to teach you. And really what this video was, was a response to what I've preached and what I teach about this. And it wasn't directly, it wasn't, it wasn't directly in any way associated with me, which is fine. And again, I'm not, I don't want this to be personal. The point is, that, is just this idea of having these YouTube preachers out there that are, that are taking on a position. You know, I don't have a particular axe to grind with, with this person or anybody, but it's, it's something really that you need to watch out who you're listening to. And if you have this desire to be a teacher, do it according to knowledge. I listened to this video and I, it's clear he doesn't even comprehend the issue that he's trying to refute. He has no comprehension, literally, of what the issue even is. And so many people have this problem. They, they have this, this inability to even comprehend what it's about. They hear the subject of the homos not being able to get saved. Because that's what I teach, and that's what I preach, and that's what I believe. That if, some, that if you're a sodomite, you are not able to get saved because God has hardened your heart because you have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. You've rejected the gospel and God has given you over to a reprobate mind. So people will hear a teaching like that and they don't like that. It doesn't sit well with them. Maybe it's something they've never heard before and it doesn't make sense. But the reason why it doesn't make sense is because they don't understand the whole argument. And the reason why it's evident is because nothing was covered as far as all of the scriptural evidence Look up all the references for reprobate. reprobate. If you're going to do a sermon or a study, a Bible study on reprobates, you can start off by going and reading in context all of the verses that have to do with reprobates. And while you're on the subject, if you really want to learn and study more about it, just the concept, is it even possible for someone to be rejected of God? Well, let's think, hmm, where else in the Bible have I read something about people not being able to be forgiven? Oh yeah, when the Bible talks about the unforgivable sin of blaspheming the Holy Ghost. Well, there is a concept. There is possible for somebody not to receive forgiveness. Why is it so difficult to understand? How about, oh, I don't know, maybe in Revelation chapter 22, when it talks about someone, if they add, take from, or you know, if they add to or remove from God's word, he's going to add all the plagues unto them and remove their name out of the book of life? What about those people? What about the person that takes the mark of the beast? 
and says that they will go to hell. That there is no hope for them. That they are damned to hell. Everyone that takes the mark of the beast is going to be thrown into the lake of fire. They have no hope of salvation. You have all these other examples in the Bible. Yet the big thing that he brought up was Romans 10. Romans 10. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That was his refutation of, this, of, of, con, of the concept of a person being reprobate and unable to be saved. He has no understanding of the whole issue at hand, yet he wants to go and teach others. See, look, the Bible says all we got to do is call on the name of the Lord to be saved. So how can you have someone just because they commit the sin of homosexuality not able to be saved? And again, just showing the ignorance, not understanding the topic. No one ever says, it's never been my contention, just because you commit this sin, it means you're no longer saved. No. Read Romans 1 in context. It says, first, when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. And they became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. After that, after that step... Then God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. When they change the natural use of a man against nature and doing those things which are not convenient. Doing you know, men lying with men and women lying with women. That is the point. So the homosexuality is the result of them being rejected. It's not a difficult concept to understand, but if you want to understand the concept, if you want to know the teaching about it, why don't you listen to it first before you go off half cock and try to teach other people that what, what we're teaching is wrong? Understand the issue before you even go off trying to refute it. And don't use something that just says, oh, well, whosoever shall call upon the name of death. Of course that's true. That's not a contradiction to what we teach at all. The problem is these people cannot believe. Look up in the book of John. Do your study and see where it says, They could not believe. For that Isaiah saith, and it quotes the Old Testament of Isaiah saying that, um, The people shall hear and not understand, and see and not perceive, lest they shall hear with, hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and should be converted, and I should heal them. In John, I think it's chapter 5, I'm not sure exactly on the reference. In John it says that, they could not believe. The people that were being preached to could not believe. It was not possible for them to believe. Look at Pharaoh in Egypt. He hardened his own heart first. When Moses came to him, he hardened him. Who is the Lord? Yeah, I don't, I don't have any respect for that. He hardened his own heart. But after a while, Mo Pharaoh could not let the children of Israel go because God hardened his heart. He didn't have a choice in the matter after that. He had free will for a long time. He had his choice. But when he finally was reprobate and rejected of God, God said, nope, your heart is hardened. It's not that difficult of a concept to understand. Now look, if someone wants to disagree with me on that issue, fine. And if you want to lay out biblical evidence for it, Fine. And if you get to the point where you understand the subject enough to refute and, and go on different points and say, this, fine, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people, though, who want to be these YouTube preachers and want to teach other people and they don't even understand what they're talking about. And literally, in that video, I think it's so hard to listen to because almost every single thing that was even said was just incorrect. It was just inaccurate and not true. Being a teacher is a good thing. Wanting to teach other people. And, you know, I don't want to be too harsh on this guy. I honestly believe that he is, his heart's in the right place and he's interested in the truth. But he should not be making these videos because he doesn't know what he's talking about. He has a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. He wants to be a teacher, but he's not getting the training. Think about any trade anything. You want to learn how to write a pr computer program, work on a machine. I used to work in a machine shop, right? I was an apprentice. I had a trainer. I had someone who was teaching me how everything worked, how the tools work, how to do the different things, the different tricks and techniques that he's learned over the years. 
I had to be taught. I was not in a position to start teaching someone else how to do stuff because I was still in training. I was still learning. You, everyone has to go through that process of learning, learning, sitting down, being faithful in church, learning how to sit there and listen before you can go off and teach someone else. It's just the way it is, but too many people these days want to just go off and just teach everybody everything about what they think they know and they don't know anything. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 7. We're almost done. Matthew chapter 7. When you teach doctrine, when you teach the Bible, one of the things that you do almost inherently, depending on what you're teaching on, is you're judging. You're making a judgment. You're, you're, you know, it's God's judgment ultimately, but when you're teaching about something, oftentimes it's, it ends up judging people, right? Look at Matthew 7, verse number 1. The Bible reads, Judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye, thou hypocrite? First cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. These YouTube preachers, they want to teach people stuff. They want to help get that moat out of your eye. But the vast majority of them have a beam coming out of their own eye. They want to correct me or other, bibli you know, other biblical teaching. Look, it, and I don't want to make it about me because it's not. It, it doesn't really matter. They want, to, they want to correct what they consider to be heresies or, or incorrect doctrines, all this other stuff. So they try to teach and they're making these judgments that, oh, yes, yeah, so the people who believe that, that homosexuals are reprobates, they're just, you know, they're making a judgment and saying they're just completely wrong about that. And they're trying to teach and they're trying to pull this moat out of someone's eye and they've got this big beam in their eye. For example, if you have not read your Bible one time, cover to cover, front to back, so that you can say that you've read every word of God in the Bible, yet you want to teach people, you have a huge beam coming out of your eye. Don't try teaching other people what the Bible says until you read the whole thing. And make sure you know you've read the whole thing, not, well, I mean, I've been reading it for quite a while, and I pick the Bible up, and I read a little bit here, and I read a little bit there. You haven't read the whole thing. You make sure you've read your Bible I mean, at least once. You want to correct people who read the Bible every single day and have read the Bible, I mean, scores of times? Make sure you know what you're talking about. Or, if you are forsaking the assembling of believers, if you are not getting in a good church, if you are not listening to preach, if you're not going out soul winning, you have a huge beam in your eye. Get in church, get that beam out of your eye, get in the local assembly of congregated believers before you go out and try to teach other people stuff. It's ridiculous. And all of that, you know, I'm probably not going to convince any of those YouTube preachers out there. Probably not going to happen. And you know what? I don't care. Because the main point and purpose of this is for you to be careful, one, who you're getting your teachings from. Where, uh, what, don't just click on every video and, and, and just, you know, I mean, these people, who knows what they are? Who knows what they, what they believe? Who knows what they teach? I mean, you can start listening to them a little bit, but then you can start getting screwed up on doctrines when you finally realize, oh, this person isn't even saved. At least with a pastor of a church, you can get to know them and see what they're doing and judge them by their fruits. We're in Matthew 7, right? Flip down a little bit to verse 15. 
Because this is in context what this is even talking about. Verse 15, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. So the warning is, hey, there's false prophets out there. You need to watch out for them because they're going to come to you looking like they're a sheep. They're going to look like they're one of you, but inside they're a wolf. Beware of those false prophets. How are we going to know? How are we going to beware? I mean, if they look like a sheep, how am I going to know? Verse 16, You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. This doesn't mean you're going to know every Christian by their fruit, but every false prophet you're going to know by their, by their fruit. Every, every teacher, someone who's preaching, prophesying, trying to teach others, where's your fruit? How am I going to judge you when you just have some video post online? I can't. You're going to be able to know them by their fruits. What are they doing? What's the result? What's happening? Or how are they helping people? How are they reaching people? How are they reaching the lost? Oh, here's someone that says they got saved through his ministry. They're a convert. What do they say? Well, when you go into a church, you can, you can see the results. You can talk to the people. You can be a part of the church. You can see the pastor. You can talk to the people he's talked to. And you can figure it out. What are the fruits? Is this a false prophet? Are all of his converts just, just believing in heresy? Just believing in false gospel, false salvation? Well, it's probably because the, the, the pastor is a false prophet. You can't really do that very well by just reading a book or watching some video. Now, there's a lot of resources put out there by people that aren't even saved. Some people are saved, but some people are saved and they got a big old beam in their eye and they're not even in church and not even learning good. They're just, they're just off on their own, you know, picking up things here and there off of the internet, off of people who aren't even saved and coming up to their own conclusions and they're just, they're just completely faulty in their understanding. But, you know, and, and some people on, on some of the issues they're correct about. And this is what's even more, you know, important to look out for. For example, there's a lot of people out there that are King, KJV only. They're solid on the King James. And maybe you're looking for stuff. You want to listen to people who are King James only. You want to hear what they have to say. So you click on a video or read a book or whatever and you got all, all these arguments and stuff. Okay, yeah, it's good. And then you start saying, oh man, I wonder what else this guy has, has for me to learn. Thinking that because they're KJV only that they must be saved and they must be right on all these other issues. So I want to listen to what, what other teachings that they have. But there are a lot of people out there, they put out the material about the KJV. You make that assumption and they teach all kinds of strange doctrines. A big example of that is, is Peter Ruckman. He's KJV only. He's got a lot of materials on KJV only. But that guy teaches the doctrines of devils. That guy teaches all kinds of bizarre, uh, of bizarre teachings. Brian Denlinger is another guy. Martin Richling is another. I don't know if he's KJV only, but you know these people put out these videos. Sam Gibson, another one. Watch out for these teachers. They have lots of, of false doctrine. And you know, I don't care about naming the names. These are just some of the people. And, and I don't spend that much time on YouTube. There's probably a whole bunch of others that, that have all kinds of views and people listen to you and watch and whatever. There's probably a, a ton of them. But I don't know because I don't really spend that much time trying to find out all these different things. Do I like listening to good preaching? Yes. But the preaching I like listening to comes from either... Churches I've physically been to. Now, I've been on vacation a bunch of times. I've visited different churches and churches that I like very well. Churches that of, of friends that I know that are pastors, but also churches I've just been to. I've met the pastor. I've sat in church. I've seen the fruits. I've listened to a preach. I don't hear any false doctrine coming through. Hey, they're great. And I'll recommend them to other people. But I like going more off of at least recommendations from people who are already saved. They're listening to this person and say, yeah, you know what? There's some things I disagree with. And look, I'm not saying you have to listen to people who every single thing that they teach and preach is exactly what you believe. But you got to watch out for the snakes out there. You got to watch out for the people who are just heretics and that are, that are out there to deceive. And if you want to be a teacher, 
sit down, shut up, and learn for a while. Be humble. Be a servant. Do the good things. Do the, you know, try to follow, try to learn what someone else who is not a novice has already been through and, and has gained from experience and from their own knowledge. Try to learn from that person before you go off and be a teacher. Amen. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the pattern that you've laid out for us in the Bible. For how the church is to be organized and run and who's in charge, dear God. And for us being teacher, God, I pray that there would be more teachers. I pray that there's more men that are willing to stand up and take on these roles that are so vital to have a good church, a good God-fearing man that's willing to lead people, teach them, instruct them, and train up more people to do the same thing, dear God. But I pray for the, for the ignorance of the, of the people that, that want to do the fast track to being a teacher and thinking that, they don't have to sit and study and learn and that they can just go off as a novice. Lord, you give us a warning that, um, they'll, fall, that, that they might, that they'll probably fall into the condemnation of the devil and get lifted up with pride, dear Lord. I pray that you would please just help us to stay on the right path. Help us to be aware of this when, we, when we're listening to preaching and trying to find other people that, that, that are that are good, solid, uh, Bible-believing Christians that are, that are out there doing a good work for you, that we wouldn't get caught up in these people and we have no way of knowing um, the, the full proof of their ministry, dear Lord, but that we would just stick to the old-fashioned ways, dear Lord. We don't need all this internet stuff anyways. Let's just, let's just get plugged into our local churches and do the work that, that you have ordained for the pastors and the churches to be doing in their local areas, dear God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen.